three live. You're now watching two old farts making noises. Joe, do you know why some businesses succeed and some businesses fail? Why some businesses grow and some businesses don't? That's what this show is all about. Business, business, business. Welcome back, everyone, to the Lost Dollar Business Club. Look at this motley crew. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's been a while since we've had everybody uh, everybody all at once in the same spot. Well, John was in Austria looking for Nazi yeah. gold like usual. Kurt's That's battling good. fires or whatever he's doing in Canada. <laughs> I, I think he's just hiding from moose. David had, like, COVID and had a mm -hmm. shot of something. Could have been scotch. And uh, I was traveling the world, yeah. you know, Chase yeah. doing what I usually do. According to one of our shows, I'm a spy. So I was going around the world being a spy. And that was it. It was very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Corporate yeah. espionage. Yeah. It was, a it, was a it was a retention order, but it's been lifted now. So. Yeah, that's right. I'm surprised, so, man, that are, yes. I'm surprised that you were going out, you know, being a good Jewish boy that you are. That you were out there in you know in Arab land with all this the shit that's going on. <laughs> well, just, I, you know, don't, John, don't let me just say correct, John. Well, yeah, yeah, John, that's fine. <laughs> John, let me, well, John, you know he's a Nazi. Um, so here's why, John, <laughs> because I have balls, and I will say this: Qatar Airlines, mwah, they're up there with Emirates. I would fly Qatar again anywhere on the planet. They are they have the nicest flight crew. They have the best food. I, I'm just gonna sound horrible, and I don't care. The best suite, I like. I closed my door. No one bothered me. I mean, except the flight attendant who tucked me in at night and gave me a little kiss. It was very cute. Anyway, and I said to him, "I'm married. Don't do that again." Anyway, um, so it was very nice. Um, and they, the the hospitality when we got to the UAE and even at Doha, which is in Qatar, out of this world. And Michael, how easily you're corrupted, picture. aren't you? Just a little. Listen, a, my a loyalty can be my loyalty can be bought with my loyalty can be bought with hot flight attendants, good food, and a class A yeah. suite. That's it. I'm yeah. I'm a cheap date. But I will say this: at the yeah. Qatar airport on my layover back home, uh, I sent Michael a picture. Um, I think you all saw. Okay, you got thirty the, seconds because we're still on the show. I don't really care, John. It's, I'm I'm the I'm the one of the producers and I'm one of the directors. We'll do whatever I want. Um, <laughs> so the Qatar Business Lounge, just so you know, is the size of two football pitches, and it has literally Michelin star chefs. And the food there was better than any Michelin restaurant I have ever been to. They yeah. they well, go above and beyond. So yeah, it was very. It has no character. I don't care. It's, it's just no very character. For Michelin star McDonald's. There you go. That's very good. Yeah. Well, look, guys, we've got another John on the air today, John Kerr, who is the author of, so every industry, every profession has at least one person who's written the book. And John Kerr has written, written many books about my profession, which is sales engineering, solutions engineering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he wrote Master in Technical Sales, right. um, Sales Engineer's Handbook. He's also written the Sales Engineering Manager's Handbook. Wow. And uh, I met him in New York City uh, by chance a few weeks ago, and okay. said, "We've got to get him on the show. We've got now, to get him." This at the court. This okay. was at the court hearing, right, where they were <laughs> going to debate if they were lifting the restraining order, or was this? <laughs> I mean, I can't comment on that. I'm not. Okay, honest. okay. No. So, but anyway, we're very excited to have John Kerr yeah. on the show, and right. uh, he'll join us in just a moment. Very cool, David. Get the freedom and the flexibility of remote work in the lucrative tech industry. Bend your life around, around the world. Bendicoot is the premier course and community for thriving in a remote tech career. Join the revolution today. Bendicoot.com, official partner of the Lost Dollar Business Club. All right, let's bring him in. All right, here you go. We're gonna, now, first of all, before we bring him in, let's not discuss the Phillies because he gets very emotional not about it. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's discuss the Phillies. John, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks, John. This is, this is quite a, a, a wall of fame or a wall of shame I see in it's front of It's a wall of shame, John. Let's oh, not get yeah. carried away. All right. Yeah. <laughs> But the good thing is that over over four people will see the show, which is nice out of our 26,000 fans. Now, last week I, I was out of town and they spoke about this subject and I think they got a few thousand views, 
which is yeah, actually good. And you're a famous author, so that should even make it more. And you can, you as we tell everybody, if you have a new book or something coming out, feel free to prostitute the heck out of yourself. And we will do the okay. best we can to have our fans love you. We support, yeah. we support the books. We support there you them. go. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is great. So, John, like, not everyone on this call and and uh, on this podcast, and certainly not in our audience, even knows what sales engineering is. So, I think it'd be great if you just started us off by talking to us about what is a sales engineer, and uh, and give us that framework for how important it's been or how not important it's been over the past thirty or forty years. Sure, Michael. So this is a, a question we get asked a, a lot. It's the cocktail party question, which is, you know, mm -hmm. what the heck is a sales engineer? What do you do? So it, it is at the very highest level, probably one of the best jobs in the world that no one ever knows about. Sure. And there's around two, two and a half million of us globally who do it. Um, and it kind of works this way. Think about a, a sales rep you know, from any tech company um, selling any business product, actually. So think of you know, the glad handing sales rep from, you know, CA, BMC, Oracle, Cisco, whatever, who comes in, makes the relationship, tries to sell some products. At some point, they have to bring a more technical person in to explain how the damn thing actually works and demo it and present it and link the technology to the business. And so that is what a sales engineer does. It's really a hybrid position. It's almost a unicorn that has a mix of technical skills, business skills, and sales skills. Um, so that's who we are. And that's what we do. And it's an awesome job. It is. It, it is definitely an awesome job. And I've been doing it for uh, nine years now, uh, selling computer software for 15 and uh, love, love the position because of that blend of, of things that you get to do in terms of working with customers, working with prospects and working with people in the company. Um, curious to know, though. So how to tell us a little bit about how you started in uh, sales engineering and, and what what inspired you to start writing the book for that is now uh, well known as the standard for our profession. Sure. So I actually graduated um, more years ago than I care to remember with a degree uh -huh. in chemical engineering, right, from Imperial College in London, and went to work for ESSO, a UK affiliate of Exxon. And I was an engineer crawling around an oil refinery doing stuff. Yeah. And then this company came in that was selling some kind of technology that actually made life easier for the engineer. And I loved it and I picked it up. And I actually became kind of their internal salesperson um, to the point mm -hmm. where when they were looking to expand their sales engineering stuff, they said, hey, you know, you, you're, you're really good at taking all this technical stuff and explaining it to, you know, those dumbass business people out there. Do you want a job? And it was an American company. And, you know, oh, I was still in the UK. And I said, absolutely. Um, you know, my, my wife, Allison, is, is American. We'd love to move back to the U.S. So I'll take a job um, if and only if you give me a job in headquarters in Princeton, New Jersey. And sight unseen, they said yes. And three months later, there I was in Princeton, New Jersey, starting my life off as a sales engineer. Um, so that's how I got into the profession. Um, so it's an accidental profession. right? I mean, if you look around an audience of sales engineers and say, imagine that you're eight, nine, 10 years old, sitting around the dinner table with your parents or your grandparents. And they look at you, you know, and they say, Michael, John, Stephen, what do you want to be when you grow up? No one ever puts their hand in the air and says, mommy, I want to be a sales engineer. Yeah. You know, there's <laughs> two, two and a half million of us, right? I'm glad, I'm glad you bring that up because uh, yeah, the, the, you probably know a lot of people in terms of how they've, gotten into sales engineering and so what are some of the most unusual ways that uh, people have gotten into sales engineering because my own pathway was definitely not intentional uh, I was a BDR I was a, a sales development representative making cold calls and uh, just really got into enjoying the working on the product and having a somewhat of a technical background so uh, fell into it when the opportunity came to me as well similar to to you they just wanted to hire a sales engineer and I said I raised my hand and said yeah I could do that but um, a lot of people have had very interesting ways of getting into it and maybe give some hope for people maybe listening to the podcast that you too can get into it if you want to. Yeah. So basically, there's nothing that would stop you from becoming a sales engineer, almost regardless of your, your background. You don't need a super strong technical background. Uh, I mean, you certainly need brains. You need adaptability. But over the years, I've hired thousands of sales engineers and their backgrounds have been incredibly varied. Uh, I've hired um, semi-pro musicians, um, a Shakespearean scholar, 
um, literally a rocket scientist from NASA um, came to, to work for me. Um, English majors, history majors, as well as, you know, standard IT and people with you know, business backgrounds, MBAs. So really, it's you know, do you have the capability to bridge technology, understand business and then explain it to people? And if yeah. you can do that, then the job is suited for you. So now to involve some of the, because we've got some business experts, financiers on this call, you know, on our we podcast. Do? No I'm kidding. kidding. So yeah. 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 <laughs> other people joined our, other people have joined the show since I was gone for a week. Awesome. Yeah. I want to meet these people. So. And uh, yeah, so I mean, maybe you can relate the, uh, the sales engineering position to, um, to business in general and how it's, how it's plugged into so many other parts of the business, like product and engineering and connected to executives and talk about how it's, Talk about that connection, uh, first of all. Sure. Wait, bef be before you do, though, I've, we've used these guys, not you per se, but so like when we did like NetSuite or we've done an Oracle, you mm -hmm. know, you've got the person, I, I, and for the youngsters out here, if you don't know what this means, I don't care. We had the person that did press the flesh, and they don't even do that anymore. They just get on the phone and try to sell you a, a checklist. Yeah. And then we get, if you will, the John or Michael that comes on the phone, or they never showed up, but they get on the phone. I guess in the old days, you guys would actually show up. Um, yeah. They get on the phone and then we go literally step by step and make a diagram of everything from mm -hmm. from A to Z of what we need, how it's going to do and the installation time frame and whatnot. So mm -hmm. we, would you guys make our lives easier? It's like when we did NetSuite at one of the companies. It was supposed to take, I think, 18 months. But with the diagram, we got it down to three um, because our sales engineer worked with us. So I was like, no, no, do this, do this, do this. And he's like, oh, you you have smart people. I'm like, yes. So I found that you guys actually helped to streamline the process. And then we, we even saved money using the, in their internal sales engineer. Yeah. So I, I like to think that we do make things easier. Yeah. I mean, my, right. my analogy for what was the sales engineer do, do organizationally to get back to the original question is you can think of the sales engineers as really the, the oil that drives the engine, not just of sales, but of the entire business, particularly in a technology company. SEs, to use the acronym, touch sales, professional services, engineering, support, product marketing, product right. management, uh, even a little bit of like HR and legal as well. So you know, we get to touch everything. We're customer facing. So we know exactly how our customers are using our stuff, um, both the way it's supposed to be used and the off label uses mm -hmm. as well. And they can bring that back to the the organization plus you know, we have a bunch of relationships as well so I, I do like that analogy that we are really the the oil that keeps the engine of the entire company running um if, if all your se's disappeared at any company um you, know, you can ask this you can ask a you know, cro or even a ceo like, hey you know what would happen if all the sales engineers in your company disappeared and they sit back and they think about it for about 20 seconds. Then they get this horrified look on their face. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Like the entire company would collapse. Well, there you go. So elevated positions there, uh, uh, David and crew and uh, Steven. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. so, so you guys know, you know, SE is pretty good. Yeah. But no, no, uh, let me help you out. Without, listen, the, my the, job, we're the, the, the oldest question profession. Is, the question is. So. Without you're, us, you're, you guys don't have jobs. Just, That's right. just keep that. Just keep. Just keep that in mind. Without what my people do, yeah, yeah. and I'm not talking to Jews, John. Calm down. Um, without what my people do, the finance guys, which is the oldest profession, oh, yeah. you guys don't have jobs. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> so. it, 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 it sounds to me like it's just that that um, if companies really want to save money, they should just rip out the whole sales department because they're not needed. If the SEs guys are, are doing the doing the Jesus work for everybody, what do you need salespeople for? At, at, at its most extreme, David, um, that is the way that part of the industry is going. The, the role yeah. of the sales engineer is like involved. The salespeople, do you need they just come over the last twenty I, years? You know, uh, nice yeah. suit, got the old clock on the, got the old Rolex on, the whole shebang, and then somebody who actually knows something comes in afterwards. Yeah. So why have why have a sales team? Waste it. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. My viewpoint on that, David, is that uh, the, the best account executives are really good at maintaining mm -hmm. deal, deal velocity, just keeping these deals moving right. forward across a lot of different deals. And it's I see it as I see SEs as, uh, as partners to the account executives very much. So maybe I've been fortunate to work with really good 
account executives. I'm sure that's not always the case, but uh, but yeah. yeah but I, if you listen, I, I if you listen to stuff. if you listen to to, jo to John's gospel about sales engineers, and I mean that in the nicest way, John, then you don't actually need salespeople. Yeah. I wouldn't I, I would disagree with that categorization, David, uh, on more Michael's side that it is a partnership. But I think the balance of power uh, you know, it used to be sales engineers work for salespeople. And now it is truly a partnership. And you can right. think it, it's kind of like sports. You know, I mean, you play. Oh, so we go and from it, we go from engagement to marriage. And the next step has to be divorce then. So, <laughs> no, but I will. I will say. I will say this. You're showing your not, age there, David. Yes, right. I will say this though. Not every sales engineer that we have had to work with over the years has a personality. Yeah. So True. not every sales engineer, like John and, and Michael. I was going to say John and Bindicut, but that's not his name. Um, John and Michael um, are, I, I, I think, different than most. Most are going to be very kind of like. You know, ABC, leave me alone. These guys have personalities. A lot of the ones that we've worked with in the past, they don't have personalities. Mm. So if you don't have a gregarious, just outgoing, like, ha, in your face, that like, you're not going to sell. Um, half of the, the sales, they're not going to pick up the phone and go, would you like that? And if an incoming calls, they don't want to answer. So I think you do. You need, if for as one of my friends would say, you need the people that can do the carny. You need the people that put on the show. Mm -hmm. And then when, the sh when you bought the ticket to come under the tent, now you need the performance. So the sales engineer, mm -hmm. if you will, is more of the performer that just does his, you know, he's conducting the orchestra for you. The the oh. guy, the barker that's getting you in, that's your account executive. So if you look at it in that way, you do need the barker. If you don't have that, yes. then no one's going to be buying products. I think that's no, basically, what, basically what you need is a tent with a door, and then you just need somebody to usher them through. <laughs> At the door. Yeah. I, I think you also, this is industry specific, right? The, I mean, to yeah. some degree, it's going to be industry specific. There's no, not every industry can you use that as you basically your hammer, right? Sometimes right. You're, you you need somebody to open the door, and that's going to work really well as a door opener, but not necessarily as a closer where you need somebody who's who knows how things really work on the ground. Because some industries, there is a lot of nuance in there. And it doesn't matter how hard you, you try to explain it on the phone or, or in a video call, you're not going to nail it down until you're standing, like, like, John, like uh, Stephen said, pressing the flesh, standing in the, in the, in the yeah. actual space and selling it in space. You, you just can't do it virtually. But I guess there are some industries where you can do this 100%. Right? Oh, but I, I, think, I think there are a lot of sales engineers who are uh, consistently in the field. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, it's, the technology industry isn't the only industry with sales engineers. There's, and there are other titles for it. And in fact, there are probably dozens of titles that are alternate to sales engineer. I mean, not, mine is even solutions engineer. It's 45 at last count. Yes. 45 at last count, exactly. <laughs> A lot of no, different... all, I can, all I can say is that that is just so American. You know, give, a, give somebody a title, you know, and lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, it, it, it's it, it gives us something. It gives us a lot of interesting things to write about. And speaking yeah. of writing about, I mean, John, you've yeah. written these books over a long time. So tell us about what has changed in sales engineering and what hasn't changed, because there are some fundamental things that are probably common to everybody on this call that are that are core to the sales engineering profession. Yeah. So what's mainly changed has been, I think, the the use of technology within the profession and the the tooling that sales engineers have and that partnership between sales and you know, the sales engineer i mean but if i think back to when i started as an se and mm -hmm. what SEs do now, and you know, there's decades in between that, the yeah. fundamental job of understanding you know, understanding your customers or your prospects' business, um, trying to uncover not just their pains, but also their hopes and dreams, and then matching that to your technology and showing yeah. why you're uniquely qualified to solve their business problems and satisfy their hopes and dreams, that remains the same. And it doesn't matter, you know, whether you know, solution selling, Kappa, Taz, challenger sale, value selling, whatever, mm -hmm. you're still trying to take that journey with the customer and you know, push them over the line, both technically and businessly. And, and that hasn't changed. Um, as I said, what has changed is the, the amazing technology that sales engineers and salespeople now have to make their life easier. 
I mean, I look at the, the stuff that you know, people have now and think, oh, my goodness, I wish I had that when yes. I was running a team 10, 15, 20 or more years ago. Like my life would be so much easier. Yeah, we've got we've got a lot more software now and uh, a lot. And, and there's a there's a there's a different respect for I think it's you know, we call it pre-sales as well. Yeah. Um, that's actually how we met was through the pre-sales collective, which is a right. group, a, a, an international group of sales engineering professionals, people who are aspiring and people who are in it. And uh, that's how we got to know each other at, at, at the New York event. Um, but but even that organization is only I think it's only five or six years old. So yeah, uh, th those kinds of groups are are now available, which were not available before when I started. Yeah, I mean, there's been like now pushing a billion dollars of VC investment into the space to enable and tool um, the sales engineering profession. So the the low end part of the job, you know, is getting automated. No big surprise. So yeah. you know, it, started, it started a while back with automating RFI and RFP responses and things mm -hmm. like that. But now you had demo automation. Um, you have bots that mount, monitor proof of concepts running up in the clouds. Uh, you have companies like, like Viven and Consensus who have all these mm -hmm. dashboards and everything. Um, so you know, the amount of tech that's getting poured into the business now is, is phenomenal. So now I have a question. <laughs> so in about five years, will you be obsolete? Because as tech, a lot of I think a lot of positions will because of AI. But yeah. so when Hal two thousand and one shows up, are you obsolete then? And we so, talk a lot about Hal on this show. So yeah, we, we, we do. I'm so, his idol. So, so, so. Stephen, let me kind of like be a politician and twist your question a little bit. Sure. Um, and think five or ten years from now, would I rather be a salesperson or a sales engineer? Right. right. I would rather be a sales engineer because that right. job kind of almost to David's point 10 minutes ago, will still exist. And the reason right. is, if you ask customers who provides the most value to you and your team when you are you know, evaluating a technology purchase, the answer right. comes back you know, two to one, three to one, that it's the sales engineer over and above the account team, um, the website, right. and even executives from the vendor. And I think all the time that demand is coming in through the customers, the SE profession is at least way safer than anything else out there. All right. But if Hal gets to a point where it can do what you do, mm -hmm. then does that then to start taking a day the as people get older, you know, because Michael is going to one day, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so as people get older, though, is am I going to replace Michael with John um, or Am I going to replace them with Hal because mm. Hal can do more and it's a one-time fee for me to have Hal do it? Hey, you're going to gradually see that be bleeding into, again, at the bottom end of the business. I mean, that, their, right. their bots are going to buy from our bots. Right, right. right. Yeah, it's already happening for, you know, low-end commodity stuff. You know, you're buying mm -hmm. whatever batteries and things like that. Right, right. Um, but that, that's going to start percolating up. Uh, I think where the value of the sales engineer or humanity is, is in the more, you know, the more complex kind of out of the box solutioneering in terms of putting things mm -hmm. together, the creativity, um, but you know, certainly, certainly automation. I mean, there's an automated version of me. So you know, we deliver <clears throat> some of our workshops and there's a, you know, we have this uh, product, Walter, it basically is chat GPT. That's an animated, right. you know, AI version yeah. of me that you can role play with. Um, you know, so that's oh, cool. already in place. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Didn't know. Didn't know about that tool. That's great. Yeah. How do people? How do people see that or check it out? Uh, you know, it scares the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can duplicate. You know, uh, duplicate yourself. So, John, yeah, is there a website if they want to yeah. check you out? If they want to see the animated John, how do they find uh, you? No, that, that is something that we actually provide as a service to clients. Oh, I mean, okay. actually, well, we've got maybe 15, 20 clients using it right now. I mean, you can always go to the masteringtechnicalsales.com website, and there's tons of stuff there. One, one more time, what is it? So, www.masteringtechnicalsales.com. Okay. One of the so it's basically websites. the title yeah. under your name.com. Yeah, the title under my name.com. That'll take there you to the, the website, and there you can download a catalog, collateral, information about the books and everything else. That's cool. Can I go back to a disturbing statement that uh, that, that uh, Michael made? He talked about pre-sales. Yes. So what's all that about? Is that the guy who stands <laughs> <laughs> before, <laughs> before, the set, before the salesman? So we've yeah. got pre-salesman, salesman, sales engineer. 
What, what's all that about? So, so that, that is the very old title for the profession. Uh, back when you, know, you used to do humongous corporate licenses and you'd sell whatever, you know, five million euros, pounds, dollars worth of stuff and then disappear for two years and then come back. Um, so the sales engineer got involved before the sale and was connected with the salesperson. The sales ha the sale happened and they went away. Um, now, you know, when you're in a, in a, in a annual recurring revenue or monthly recurring revenue, I don't think there's such a thing as pre-sales anymore. You're just in a continuous sinusoidal wave of uh, selling and then ramping and selling and, and ramping. So pre-sales yeah. is the old title that everyone knows. It's like a collective noun, uh, but I don't think anybody's actually called a pre-sales engineer anymore. No, no, I think that's okay. I definitely think that's the case. So oh, it's, a, it's a bit of a bummer for your group that it's called pre-sales engineering. Yeah, <laughs> well, the pre-sales well, pre yeah. collective. Yeah, pre-sales so. collective. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but everybody in the business doing. knows what it is. So yeah. right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And they're doing they're doing uh, really really well. I mean, they've they've come a long way in five years. They've got uh, sales engineers all across the world, and uh, they have a new uh, a new director who I had the good chance of meeting Chris Mabry, who mm -hmm. is going to take it to another level. And, and I think this idea of professional communities and taking professional communities to a, a serious level is, is a really important development for our profession, but it's certainly important for, for really all professions. Yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, so just to kind of give you another viewpoint of this, if you look at the Genesis story, right, of how my company and how I got started, um, over 20 years ago now, I was sitting, I still remember, in a windowless ballroom in Atlanta, Georgia, going through the fifth sales process training of my career, solution selling or something. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a week long. Um, I'm an SE director at the time. I have 40, 50 of my people in the room. And there's maybe 120 salespeople. This entire week. And we get to Friday lunchtime. My brain is numb. My butt is numb. And I turn to you know, one of my direct reports sitting next to me and say, like, why are we in this room? It's five days of training, only a day and a half of it is relevant to us. And we can absorb it three times faster than all these dumbass salespeople. And she just turned around, looked to me and said, if you're so smart, why don't you write a book about it? And I said, uh, that, that is a great idea. Um, and so I did um, together with a colleague, Aaron Bollig, and that was 2001. Um, yeah. I started the actual company a few years later, and it was just me. Um, and now we are, you know, I can say this, a global company. We have 30 workshops. We deliver in, I know, 10 different languages, locations all over the world. And we've trained, uh, getting close to like 100,000 sales engineers at this point. Nice. Um, all, all from frustration because I couldn't find anybody to train my people the way they needed to be trained because sales training just doesn't cut it. Right? And that's that's how we got started. That's a, No, that's that's a great that's point. Incredible. I mean, the, yeah, that, that's a really good good point in that um, just it, it comes out of the, I mean, came out of necessity and frustration, but but also that um, I, I'm curious to know what are some of the pitfalls of new sales engineers, you know, people who are new to the profession that they need to avoid or watch out for, because I'm sure there's a lot of a lot of that. <laughs> so, so many. Um, I, I'll tell you a little personal story. So the very first sales call I went on, um, I went along with my sales manager at the time, a guy called Joel Banner, I still remember it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I actually knew the product pretty well because I'd been a user, so I could demo it, but I had like, zero sales skills. Mm -hmm. so we go out, um, we speak to this customer, we do the demo, walk out we're in the parking lot joel turns to me and says so john how do you think it went i said joel i thought that was great huh? i answered every question they had i showed them all the features and everything else and joel just kind of like came up to me put his arm over my shoulder and said john just remember this you don't get paid by the word and i just yes. looked at him and said what do you mean he said you don't get paid by the word right we get paid by selling deals um, don't confuse educating with selling and that is a lesson that has stuck with me you know, decades, decades later. Um, and it's the advice I give every young sales engineer is, you know, yes, you're being paid to be the smartest person in the room. You don't have to prove it all the time. Right. You know, sometimes someone asks you a question, you can just say yes. <laughs> That's it. So, That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like the, uh, the idea, of course. I mean, everything evolves and there's no getting around it. We're, we're going to move in this direction regardless. Um, but I'm sure every, you know, probably everybody in the room has had moments where they're either dealing with somebody virtually that's uh, in a technical support role or they're in a sales role or they're in this role and that role. 
and there's this disconnect, right? That we're all used to, maybe it's because we're used to always having uh, direct contact with people, whether we go into a store or we, you know, uh, meet them in the hallway, whatever, it doesn't matter. But uh, we always used to that personal touch. And a lot of, whether it's sales or it's support or whatever have you, is moving so much further and further and further away. It feels like we're being read scripts constantly. And mm. that I find a bit frustrating and annoying. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's certainly true on the tech support side. Um, in, in terms of the, the human contact, uh, now post-COVID, there's a definite bounce back. Um, and certainly you've got, you know, the, the COOs and the CFOs kind of pulling the reins because they, they've loved the last three years where, you know, the travel budget has been basically zero. Um, you know, they've cut down on, you know, fixed assets and everything else. Um, but now people want to get back out in the field. Mm -hmm. Customers want to see their vendors um, and That's get them right. out in the field as well. And if you look at the proportion of classes that we are delivering physically as opposed to virtually, which to me is a good measure, you know, every month that percentage is ticking up another couple of percentage points uh, for face-to-face you know, -face delivery yep. of training as opposed to virtual. Um, and we're now at like 70-30. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, HVAC was considered an essential service during COVID. We yeah. went from, you know, <laughs> the laughs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, but, right. you know, but, you know, we, we had no choice but to go into the homes um, because people needed it. They needed air conditioning that summer, etc. cetera. Um, but the challenge was because everybody was actually in their homes and not at, at work, they were on the phones to us. So we were getting nailed. So it got to a point where 50% in some cases, 70% of the job was now being done virtually. So I understand the, you know, the technical sales engineer side of it, because now I was having to be on the phone, trying to explain to people, getting them to run around with their phone in their hand so we could take pictures and, and mm. uh, explain what was going, you yes. know, what was going on in their, in their world. So, but had I not had that in home expertise, there's no way we could have pulled that off because you'd just be literally talking out your ass the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Im imagine if COVID-19 had been COVID-04, right. 15 years earlier, and we didn't have yeah. meat and Zoom no, and FaceTime and everything else. Yeah. 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 No, and the technology was there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we got through it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I did I, I did like 70% of my sales ended up being online. Eventually, you have to go in there and measure. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, and it did end up being online. But, boy, was that tough. Because, I, uh, I don't know the I, industry. I mean, John, uh, what I've what I've experienced, and, and certainly Kurt, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, I think the the pressing the flesh and being face to face. There's nothing. There's there's nothing better than that. At the same time, um, I think COVID is and and all this remote remote interaction has shown us that some of the interactions can be done remotely, and in fact, that can keep things moving forward faster because I don't need to fly out to see the customer every single meeting. I can actually do that maybe just at the beginning of the deal and at the end of the deal, or I can do that at, at key moments during the during the interaction. But um, I, I feel like there's a there's a, a renewed balance, and I don't know maybe John, you're seeing that too, where there's this there there is there's a lot of value for the face to face, but there's also an understanding that we can do some of this at least reliably remotely, like what yeah, we're we doing. But we see when we use some of these, whether it's Oracle, which is NetSuites and NetSuites and whatnot, and all these others, we even our sales engineer was a Zoom call. They never came and pressed the flesh. Like I said, mm -hmm. and this is going back 10 or 15 years ago, we never mm -hmm. saw anybody. They would get on a Zoom or something like a Zoom. Back then it was Skype. We'd have yep. a Skype call, go through everything. We're like, okay. And we never pressed the flesh with anybody. Um, so wow. the fact that somebody and, and our installations weren't cheap. I mean, like we were the GDP of a small third world country, but no one ever came out. So mm -hmm. I think yeah. what COVID showed is that, especially guys in my profession, you don't have to go press the flesh every 10 seconds to go do a deal because you can do a deal through the Zoom and through whatever. Um, like this last trip, we had to actually go press the flesh because it's a different type of trip um, for your deal. So it's a little different, I think. And in your case, it just depends on the customer. You know, if you think your customer is important, 
that you're going to be like, oh, let's send John and Michael to go, you know, press the flesh with them. So they go look at our smart, our, our older and our middle aged guy, the, you know, the smart guys, right? Got the guy with a little snow on the roof. You got the guy with the dark hair there. Look at our team. They're like, ooh. But I don't think companies think like that. I think it's sort of like if we don't have to spend the money, why spend it? Now, like I said, we were spending lots of lots of comments. Yeah. Never, never saw anybody in the person and we didn't care. It was like, just get it done, get it done right. And let's get yeah. going. They're like, okay. So yeah. I, I think it just depends on the product as well. Mm -hmm. And like what you guys may be selling may require a press the flesh. We have to sit in your office for an hour and tell you something where when you're doing a, a, an installation of a mega financial package or installation of a system, not really. Because most of the finance guys are just as smart. And it's just like, you know, they all know computer. It's just like, and our tech guys are. And it's sort of like, just tell us what we need. You know, I think there's a different mentality depending on the space. Like if you're dealing with attorneys, they yes, they want to see you. If you're dealing with accountants only, probably. If you're dealing with just normal people, yes. But I think when you get into certain areas, people are like, yeah, we don't really care. Like, just tell me how to go from A to Z and we're done. So I think that has a lot to do with it. And it also depends on the company too. You know, we didn't spend a trillion dollars, so Oracle didn't come visit us, and I was okay with that. The, so. There's, there's that, yes, Stephen. So, so I, I've noticed though that you have given the classic sales engineer answer about three or four times now, which is it depends. Um, right. Kurt, was, <laughs> Kurt was earlier as well. Um, we have selective memory, so if you go back to 2017 or 2018 um, right. and think it again about the enterprise software and hardware space, because that's where I'm most familiar. Even back then, so five years ago. Here in the Americas, over 50% of sales calls were being done virtually. Yep. I mean, whether it was video or just yep. over a phone. Um, yep. In Europe, it was about 35%. And in JPAC, it was under 20%, right? Because there's cultural yep. things there. So even before COVID-19, there was more and more pressure to try and do what you could do virtually. Because yep. not only is it cost efficient, it's time efficient it's as well. time efficient, yeah. yes. And, and you, know, you, you don't have to, you know, Put your rear end, you know, even even it is a Q suite on, um, you know, Qatar Airlines, Stephen, right. um, super comfortable, right? Uh, you, know, you don't have to put your butt in a seat and and go somewhere. So there's certainly that efficiencies, but it it does depend. And yeah. you're right, it depends who you're selling to, what you're selling, the volume of sales, um, how the relationship is, and everything. You know, and do they want to see you? you know, some company culture as well. Well, so, well, we learned well before COVID's. We were all laughing because when COVID came out, people were like, oh, we're having all these meetings. And I was like, listen, well before COVID, we realized that I can get up at 7 o'clock or 4 o'clock or whatever time in the morning. And by noon, I could be having meetings in seven different countries and get everything done. If I try to do that in the real world, as I just proved that the week and a half I was away, I had to be on a plane, you know, 30 hours here, an hour yeah. here, two hours. And it's like, I can't have as many meetings. So I'm very much for not having to press the flesh if it gets more things done. But there is the case where you know that client yeah. is going to be like, I want to see you in my office and then I want to have lunch with you because they're trying to get to know you. That's mm -hmm. a different story. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know, like none of this, any anytime we've ever met one of you guys in the flesh, um, you know, we, we throw you like a cupcake or something. No, um, we, like you, we don't really go to lunch with them because it's their job. So everyone just like inundates them with what they need and then they're done. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, it's not like, oh, like they're this or they're that. And it's not to belittle it. It's just that everybody's got stuff going on. So it's not like they want to spend the day babysitting. Like even the IT guys that have to do this, they don't have the time. And I think it also gets down to that now. It's all time. Yeah, no, time everybody can give up an hour, right? On a yes. Zoom call, if you will. But can they give up not just an hour if you come to see us? Then it's like, all right, they're here. All right, we have to go to lunch with them. You know what I mean? It becomes this process. Okay. So I think when you go out and really press the flesh, in a company's mind, can they afford six to eight hours? And in your company's mind, can our sales engineer afford six to eight hours? Because the six to eight hours you spend with this client, that means there's these other, say, four or five clients you're, you're not giving time to, right? So I think there is really a balancing act. And that's why I'm saying down the road to your, to your HAL 2001 that you already have one, um, I think sales engineers are going to have kind of their own little how, so they can little things how can do. That'd be great. Things they have to do. Yeah, yeah. It, risk it, it risk plays it. a big role in that, right? Yeah. Like yeah. The, the, the downside risk, right? Because sometimes, like in my industry, I've gone into people's homes that had installations done during COVID, 
it's complete garbage because the the person actually needed to walk in that that house and look at the design to go uh eh, maybe it wasn't the right furnace but okay. you know the, my yeah. question uh to uh to you is were there some people that came out of the gate a little too early on on the idea of having it and just you know it made a complete balls of their their company uh, that you came across along the way Oh, so I'll say it depends again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so without, without naming names, I mean, between, you know, between my company and up to speed, you know, our, our sister master company, uh, we have like five, 600 clients in the tech world. So they, their responses varied. And there are you know, some companies that just did an amazing job, you know, of assimilating technology uh, before COVID, going through COVID, how they emerged after it. And there's others, you know, that, just got destroyed and they were forced into mergers or just massive layoffs. Um, so they, every company handled it differently. And I, and I don't know if there's a set formula for success um, as people went through that, that you can learn and apply for the, the future. Uh, I've actually spent quite a bit of time looking at this because it's puzzled me, you know, why company, why some companies made it and some didn't and some mm -hmm. threw the doors off and, and others didn't. And I, I don't see and as an engineer it bothers me that i don't see a, a set of facts underneath that yeah. uh, <laughs> to be yeah. able to say you know here's john's theory of success yeah mm. well and uh, so i mean this is this is a, a great conversation in the last few minutes of the show because then we got to go into lost dollar and uh, lost and found dollar but wait, uh, wait, does john know what lost and found is john, john does, doesn't know what lost and found is he can have a lost and found he and stay have a lost he wants. And i'm sure he does if he wants to stay so lost and found is we pick a news item of the week uh -huh. and we say it's either a lost dollar or a found dollar. Um, and it, and just David will give some fakakta thing about Pluto or Mars or whatever. Um, but it's one of those things. It's just a fun thing that we do for the audience. And then it, it spins off into its own little short. So well, if you well, have something you want to do, you want to A news it. item, a, a snippet, news snippet. Yeah. I would be a, a lost or found. But, um, but what are your, John, your, what do you have for just final thoughts for someone who's interested in sales engineering and they, they really need to know they're, they're, they're on the fence. They're not just sure where to go. What do you, what, what kind of thoughts would you have them consider uh, it, before they made the leap? Uh, so I would say it is one of the best jobs in the world. If you choose to make it that um, mm -hmm. if you're looking for a profession that blends business skills with you know, some sales relationship skills and links in technology as well um, and pays you pretty well. I mean, uh, on target earnings here in the US is you know, 175 to 200K uh, on average for a sales engineer. So you know, you're not gonna be poor. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly something to, to look at. Um, if you want a set pattern in your life and you like to do the same thing every day, it's not for you. Um, if you want yeah. to wake up in the morning and be surprised about what's going to happen for the rest of the working day, <laughs> um, it's a fantastic job. You know, if you if you want to learn more, uh, you know, you mentioned the Pre-Sales Collective. You can go check them out. You can go check the website out. You can Google sales engineer and you'll find a ton of resources out there as well. Um, you're in demand. Uh, there are big, yeah. big companies out there now, even with this somewhat dodgy economy we have in 2023, who are actively hiring sales engineers um, from the associate graduate level all the way up to, to master principal. So you know, if you're a good SE, you are never going to starve. Mm -hmm. That's great, John. I mean, thank, thank you for the time. I think this has been a thank great you, conversation about an interesting profession. So thanks for the time, John. You're welcome. It's very cool. Thank you so much. You feel free to come back whenever again. And, uh, you know, yeah, like we never, never, never come back. <laughs> <laughs> Please come back. <laughs> you can come back whenever you would ever listen. Thank you for doing the show. Now they'll release your family. Um, but if you want to come back, please feel free. Uh, it was fascinating. Um, yeah, and it. if you just want to be on the show and just be part of the show, well, your personality is great. You can come back whenever you'd like. Yeah. See, some, some of the sales engineers have a personality, right? So I, I said that earlier, didn't I? <laughs> yes. say, I, I, I said that earlier. I did I say that earlier. Not every, I listen, but not I just want you to say that. Yeah. Has a personality. Yeah, then mm -hmm. I've been in a room with an engineer, and it was sort of like, wow, um, do, you, do you smile? Do you have a personality? just like, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. this could be fun. We, so, well, you, know, you, know. you know the old thing about how you how do you tell the difference between an introvert engineer and an extrovert engineer? Oh. 
an, an introvert engineer looks at their shoes when they're talking to you. An extrovert right. engineer looks at your shoes when they're talking to you. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using that as my next joke. We can get jokes out of the show. That's great. There you go. <laughs> All, All right. right, so we're going to do Lost and Found. John, Lost would you like to stay for that, or are you going to go and do more important things like have a, like a nosh? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have to go take my wife to a, a physiotherapy session. She had knee surgery, so I'm going to do and that. My friend, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Best to your wife, then. We'll right. see you Thank next you time. Much. Cheers. Right. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. He was a very right. nice. I, there was a, that was a wonderful get. So all our people that are watching or listening, that was a very nice guy. He's a very nice guy. Yeah, so. yeah, I think he's got it. And I mean, he's been doing it a long time and he wrote the book. So, you know, yeah. I, I was happy to have him on the show. That is very it's cool. Good get, Michael. Good get. Yeah. It's nice. All right. I, and and so now now we have to release his wife. So we'll make a call after the show. It'll be fine. <laughs> so she can go to therapy. Yeah. <laughs> so she can go right. to therapy. It'll be fine. All right. All right, David, let's do some lost and found. Lost and found. Lost and found. Welcome to this week's Lost and Found, uncovering dollar winners and losers, where we discuss dollars lost. and dollars gained by various companies and projects. Uh, David, oh, yeah. I've got been I wanted to tell you this the other day, all these new graphics I love with the movement and the this and that. It was fun on the other show that we did a couple days ago, uh, no snobs or knobs watching everybody get sick because they were drunk with the graphics, but no, it was awesome. And they, they love the graphics. So they're, oh. <laughs> David's All having right. fun with this. That's good. Is David is like a kid in a candy store. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, you know, it's me and it's Steam Yard that's given me yeah. all these all these possibilities. Cool. It's it's that's David, a, it's like a 12-year-old boy with Playboy back in the day. All right, and talking about 12-year-old like boys, that, John, like what do you got for us? <laughs> I don't think you heard is that. John, yeah, is John, I think, I think John has a still photo of himself there. He hasn't been here the whole day. <laughs> what do I got for you? Uh, Amazon reporting earnings yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I Amazon reported earnings. been down for you know, a couple of weeks. So there's a dollar right. lost for you. Um, although it's recuperated back today. So it, maybe it's a uh, dollar one also. So that's all I got for you today. All right, we well, got thank Amazon. Thank, thanks for thanks for slowing yeah, up the no, show. Super Love exciting. It. All right, I know. <laughs> Kurt, how about you? I uh, got a found. It's kind of an odd one. I, I'm kind of doing a David here. It's um, oh. it's a company called <laughs> Greens. Uh, G R E I N S. Yeah. Everybody's familiar okay. with Zambonis and what they do. You know, uh, sure. but, uh, Zamboni is a very wasteful uh, machine. Uh, right. You know, it uses a lot of water, like fresh water, to resurface right. the. Uh, and what this, the, what they create is technology that turns, um, basically, it scrapes the ice, heats okay. the water, the uh, the ice that it's collecting, and then resurfaces with that. So it's not using fresh water, oh. uh, and it's uh, you know environmentally friendly, and can also be, um, they can retrofit cool. existing zambonis. So that could wow. be a really good bit of technology to, to look at because there are over 13,000 of these things out there in the world. So this is a multi-billion dollar direction to go. I need to, I need to upgrade my, uh, my skating rink. So uh, <laughs> I to go get a green Zamboni. <laughs> All right. Well, I got something for you. And this is, this is a, I think this is definitely a found uh, depending on how you view exercise, but uh, there's a, <laughs> There was a new study in the British Journal of Sports Medicine that says that only 22 minutes a day of vigorous exercise is required to offset prolonged sitting, which, of course, yes. I think we all know. I mean, a lot of us are at computers a lot of the day or some of the day, and sitting is terrible for you. So, look, uh, you just got to do. I do two hours a day of, of, yeah. of, of stuff. I am ahead of the curve. I'm sure, going to yeah. live for at least another 15, 20 minutes. I am very excited. Thank yeah. God. Let the guy finish. 2,000 years. Yeah. I don't sit, I slouch. So, uh, I ah, kind of that's that. yeah. See, slouching is okay. <laughs> sitting is right. bad. It's so. Sitting is bad, right. But uh, yeah, uh, 20 minutes a day lowers your risk of death. So, that's good. Nice. All right. Very good. Very good. All right. Let me do mine before David gives us something about cow farts. Because oh <laughs> so this is, is this is I think this is a, this is a loss for the American people and probably the world. 
thank you, um, is the new Speaker of the House. I watched his little speech yesterday uh-huh. about how God ordained him to be here and all this other happy crap that he talked about. And he seems like a really nice guy, but he also seems like a guy in 1939 that would be with a, a little brown uniform. So I'm not overly oh, yeah. confident with the new Republican Speaker of the House, and I could be totally wrong. And if he hears this, please come on the show and correct me. But I'm just sort of like, yeah, no, you drank the Kool-Aid, pal, because he's about God and power and God gives you the elections. Now, I don't know if he's a election denier or not, and I don't care. It's just his persona. Just I'm in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, no, this is this is not All a right. good thing. Even doesn't like the new Speaker of the House. All right. I it's not that I just don't like All I heard was, all, okay, all I heard was a speech. From the speech, I am not a fan. Now, for all I know, I could go have dinner with him tomorrow night and he could be like, I'm like, I get it. You're you really believe this and that's OK. But it's just the way he put it. Huh. Seem like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen when the election comes to like the problem we had a few years ago. Where are you going to fall on this? And that's where I that's where I think I'm I'm a little worried about. It. We've seen this movie before. Yeah. Once too many times. All right, yeah. David. What aliens are evading us? What plants oh, are going to okay. eat us? Well, what cow I've pooped? actually, I've, I've actually got a slideshow for you, so you can. Uh, <laughs> you want to leave? You, you want to leave you guys on here? Here we go. Okay. Oh wow! This, this is one of it says one of Holland's most delicious sold products. It's called a Tom Puss. It's Tom called a what? You, a Tom Puss. Tom Puss. Puss. Tom Puss. Tom Puss. Okay. And I, th- I think Kurt's uh, had a bit of Tom Puss in his life as well. Okay. And, more um, than one. More than one. <laughs> and um, and Dave just did a piece of the most, for me, the most, yeah, the, the really best crossover marketing ever. So, so they get this before we start, because what they've done is they've joined up with a company called Easy Toys, and now you can treat yourself to a Tom oh Puss vibrator. Oh wow! God. Which is it? Okay. Which is it? Which is <laughs> Tom Puss color? Yeah, that's wow. That's yeah. that's treat so yourself. Sweet. This is. Have you? Do you? Are you reading this? Treat yourself to sweet pleasure with this vibrator in Tom Puss colors. Tom it works Puss air color. pressure and adds an extra layer of sensation through the sucking movement. That gently hugs your clitoris. John, I know yeah. what I'm getting you for the Christmas holiday. Now. <laughs> so, so, that so this is awesome. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This yeah. is the object. In, 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 You're this so is kind. This is available, um, yeah, at, at the Hema and the Hema. You are a dirty old boy, most, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> one of the most, one of the most um, shall we say, family orientated shops in Holland. And is it's it? Across. It, it is. <laughs> It is. It's like Kmart. (laughs) Well, for all you people that are watching this in the Netherlands, go get your your Tumpus. It's actually actually on offer. It's been reduced. Special offer for this. Because it's only just hit, literally only just hit the market. Um, David was was on the email newsletter for this thing. No, you know, this was all I, I don't want to be rude or anything, but this is going to be the short the that this is the short that I'm putting on TikTok, and this is the short yeah. I'm putting Absolutely. on Instagram because nobody in their right mind is going to believe me <laughs> if I told them I'm lost and found. This is what we did. This is the short, gentlemen. So later today or tomorrow, Welcome. this will be on TikTok and Instagram. And I'm just, are you kidding? This is hysterical. Love we this. Definitely, yeah. We definitely saved well done, the best to last, David. Okay. Okay. Congratulations. So I, Kudos, I, I, David. I, do, I do think, I do think this, the text needs to be repeated by Stephen in the wonderful <laughs> New York accent. So over to you, Stephen, and then we'll finish the show. <laughs> Treat yourself to the sweet pleasure with a vibrator and to poos colors. <laughs> it works with air pressure. Oh, my God. Imagine an extra layer of sensation. Through the sucking <laughs> movement that gently <laughs> hugs your clitoris. <laughs> oh my God! Well done. And well David, done. I think on I think on Nushi's show you should bring this up because I think this will be too funny because I just want to get Nushi's reaction and if Vicky's on gonna it. Love I'm gonna the just. Colors. I'm on the gonna floor. love the colors. Uh, yeah, there you go. So we'll for see. all you people in the Netherlands that uh, got nothing to do because winter's coming and Santa's not showing, there you go. <laughs> uh, you gotta love it. Gentlemen, only, it's only always a pleasure. Gentlemen. 
We'll see you all next Friday. Or sorry, everybody. We'll see you next Saturday morning at 6 a.m. New York EST. Um, thank you for watching and subs don't forget to subscribe. Leave your comments. If you want to buy a vibrator, reach out to John. He'll make sure that you get one. Um, and don't forget to visit our merch store. And we'll see you all next week. Have a great week, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.